We are the remaining superpower in the world, and we didn't get there by being a bully. We got there through moral clarity. Masa Amini is dead, apparently at the hands of the fashion police. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, that's not a joke. There are uh, police officers in Iran whose job it is to make sure that women are complying with the strict uh, regime of how they may dress. And you can get busted, not just for wearing, not wearing your headscarf, because most women would wear their headscarf, but maybe having a little curl of hair peeking out from your headscarf or not wearing it quite right. Um, back in earlier in September, um, Masa Amini was taken into custody for re-education by these guardians of goodness. And during the three days that she was with them on September 16th, she died. The streets have exploded with rage, but it's not just, according to reports coming out of Iran, which are hard to get, by the way, because the Iranian government is able to shut down a lot of the internet. Um, it's not just that people are upset that she died, but that she was arrested. Stephen Green, since 1979, and all three of us still remember that revolution, um, the government of Iran has been in the hands of these restrictive uh, people who take an interpretation of Islam that is as, as strict as you can get it. Um, and the people have risen up on several occasions back in 2009, back in 2017. Uh, if you go into the archives somewhere, we've had a show where we discussed the killing of Neda Sultan, who was shot dead in the streets, and we watched the video of her bleeding out and her, as her pleading eyes looked up at the camera. The people came to the streets at that time, but that uprising was put down. Is there any chance that this one succeeds and that finally this... Uh, authoritarian religious dictatorship is put down itself? Well, first of all, I want to say I certainly hope so. Uh, but before I get into the, the how or why or whatever, I want to give a shout out to Elon Musk. Scott, you mentioned that the authorities there are shutting down the, or have shut down the Internet. They shut down social media. There's only one social media outlet in Iran. I can't remember which one it is. Maybe it's Instagram. Whatever it is, they shut that down days ago. Um, Elon Musk has switched on Starlink. In Iran, so as the, that string of satellites passes overhead, all you need is one of those Starlink transceivers, and you have internet. Um, now, of course, that's illegal in Iran, and since yeah. he just switched on Starlink there, uh, there aren't any transceivers that I know of in Iran. There was no, no call for them. But if anybody wants to smuggle those transceivers into Iran, full, unrestricted, unedited internet, and suddenly these these Thug murdering bastards become the old man shouting at the clouds because they can't stop the signal. So kudos to Elon Musk for that. And whoever it is, and I'm sure they're out there risking their, their necks to get those dishes smuggled into Iran. God bless you. More like this, please. Um, you know, I don't know if something like this can, can topple a government like that. But what I do know is that Iran, a government like this, is unnatural. Uh, the Persian culture is one of the most ancient in the world. And when the Arab armies came in to impose Islam, what, uh, 1,100, 1,200 years ago, whenever it was, the, the Persians, the Iranians, as we call them now, had always looked down on on the Arabs next door as kind of the, the, their, their unsophisticated country bumpkin neighbors. And there's probably some reason for that. And there is still a lot of that attitude. But Islam was forcibly imposed on, on the people of Persia, and they retained a lot of their own ways, a lot of their own customs, and a lot of their own Zoroastrian beliefs. And so Islam in Iran is not like Islam anywhere else. They've got very much their own thing. And this really brutal, restrictive, closed-off form of Islam is not a part of Iranian culture. It has been imposed on them. And for that reason, that gives me hope that the people are going to throw it back into the sea where it belongs. Bill Whittle, you've spoken before about um, how when the United States deals with another country, um, we've got to make a distinction between the government of that country and the people of that country, especially when you're talking about a, a nation that does not have 
sort of democratic or republican processes or ideals when you're dealing with authoritarian states. Um, this makes it very difficult, actually, because on the one hand, you you know you can stand up as a secretary of state or president of the United States and and say tough things about Iran, but you somehow have to make clear to the people of Iran that we're with you. Um, how do you think? If you were in a position to be influential in that right now, either at the State Department or in the White House, what is an appropriate approach to being able to foster this revolution, um, but stay within the, you know, essentially the bounds of Western civilization? I mean, we don't just go storming in every time somebody's people rise up. How do you handle that as uh, appropriately as a U.S. president, for example? I'd say something along the lines of, um, while it's neither our job nor is it morally appropriate for us to interfere in the internal affairs of every country on the earth based on the fact that we may disagree with them, the freedom-loving people of America, including the American government, stand 100% behind the Iranian people in their fight against this tyrannical regime that is depriving them not only of the kind of rights that we consider to be American rights, but universal human rights. In fact, universal humanity. We want the people of Iran to know that the United States is morally behind them as much as we possibly can be, that they are on the side of goodness and light and freedom and truth, and that truth in the end will eventually overcome this kind of tyranny. Um, that pretty much would do it, I think. And you, you may say that, well, it's just posturing doesn't really make a whole lot of difference made a whole lot of difference in Eastern Europe when when um, when Ronald Reagan did it. One of the one of the things that was most uh, inspirational to these dissident movements like solidarity and stuff, which essentially is what corroded the Soviet Union, you know, we we, we basically the, the US and NATO put enough financial pressure on them to uh, completely weaken and 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 mess up their economy. But a lot of the, the fall of the Soviet Union came in internally from internal dissident groups. And they will tell you, uh, the ones that actually lived through this, that the two things that heartened them the most was the first of all having a Catholic Pope uh who was um, a Catholic Pope, sorry, a Polish Pope. Well, <laughs> most of the Popes are Catholic, well, not all of them if you look at the history of Popes. Uh, a, a Polish Pope gave, gave the Polish people a tremendous sense of spiritual authority that they had been, that they'd had beaten out of them for 40 or 50 years. But when uh, an American president says that this is an evil empire, when an American president says tear down this wall, uh, when, when the West makes a, a principled stand then America becomes what it's supposed to be and what it historically had been for people of oppressed countries. It was their champion. We're supposed to be the champions of freedom. And, and when you look at the debacle in Afghanistan and all the rest of it, and, and our allies rightfully say, we have no idea what America's foreign policy is going to be from week to week, let alone election to election. They're right. Our foreign policy is, is, is should be the same as our domestic policy. We are, we are the force of freedom in the world. The reason we're powerful is because we're free. We're not we're not free because we're powerful. We're powerful because we're free. And um, and these values are universal and timeless. They're the they're the essence of what this country was built upon. And America is here to represent those values in the world. And anybody who is being oppressed unjustly, we're on their side. And, and and that's all you had to say. And if you did say that, you would certainly cause me a lot less embarrassment. Uh, during the, the previous incident you mentioned about the, the woman who was shot and killed during the uh, was Arab Spring, I guess, the Obama, Barack Obama had just been elected president and and there were enormous crowds of people protesting in the streets to bring down the one government that has been the most trouble, not just for the United States, but for the West, virtually all of the soldiers that we lost in Iraq, and many of them in Afghanistan, but certainly in Iraq, died from IEVs that were IEDs that were either uh, designed by or built by or, or constructed by or placed by Iranians. And he simply could have said what I just said, and he didn't. And I suspect Joe Biden's not going to say anything either. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, be a champion of freedom and to live in a country 
predicated on freedom and not have that country live up to not not its military obligation, its moral obligation uh, to be on the side of those oppressed people everywhere. And I think Bill really crystallized what I um, think about the situation here. What is what is called for is moral clarity. I'm not saying that the president of the United States has to make some long-winded speech about um, the issue, but what he does say must be clear. It must be clear who our friends are. It must be clear who are enemies of freedom. It must be uh, clear also that unlike in a lot of countries in the world where we really don't have uh, much of a stake other than some business interests or some trade interests or some uh, expatriates who are out of our country and in theirs who we are obligated to care for, uh, we really have a horse in this race. I mean, this is these are people who have been the number one acknowledged state sponsor of terrorism for decades, and they have killed Americans. And I don't mean the Iranian people. I mean the Iranian government. The regime has killed people. And now their people are rising up and saying, uh, once again, this is not our government. Um, this is not a way to live. Um, you can't have police going around dragging people off the streets to re-education centers because they don't wear their, their scarf properly. And some moral clarity from the White House would be welcome, but also just throughout the country. I mean, we should be united in this. Um, the politics needs to stop at the water's edge in a situation like this. And we need to stand as America and say, this is wrong. And we are obligated to do what we can in the course of dealing with these people and not bend and not be uh, willing to negotiate away our moral clarity. We are the remaining superpower in the world. And we didn't get there by being a bully. We got there through moral clarity. And it's time we exercise some right now. If you've seen the video years ago of Netta Sultan lying on the back, on her back, bleeding from the throat, if you've heard this story of Masa Amini now, how can your heart not be moved by this? And how can uh, the government of the United States stand idly by while these people are crushed under the boot of religious zealots. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible. 